At 12.15 a.m. on July the 14th, 1966, student nurse Tammy Siakoff walked to the townhouse next door to hers and rang the doorbell. Tammy was searching for bread for a late night sandwich and knew her friends next door would oblige. The women were used to keeping strange hours and midnight was a perfectly reasonable time for dinner or breakfast, depending on the shift you were working or upcoming exams. Tammy tried the back door, which abutted a small alley where the hospital shuttle picked them up and dropped them off. But no one answered. It was odd for her neighbors to all be asleep or out, but Tammy glumly returned to her lodgings to figure out a different snack. Little did she know that just three hours later, eight of her friends who lived next door would be dead, each a victim of mass murderer Richard Speck. Richard Benjamin Speck was born in 1941, 200 miles west of Chicago in Kirkwood, Illinois. He was the seventh of eight children born to Mary Carver and Benjamin Franklin Speck. His mother was a teetotaler and devout Christian but after his father died in 1947, she remarried a hard drinker named Carl Lindbergh. Under the influence of his new stepfather, who had a lengthy criminal record, Speck struggled immensely in school and began drinking at age 12. The family moved frequently, and at age 13, he was arrested for the first time for trespassing. By age 15, he was getting drunk nearly every day and dropped out of school at 16, having only completed the eighth grade. He eventually found work at the 7-Up Bottling Company in Dallas, but continued to collect misdemeanors. In 1961, Speck met Shirley Malone at the Texas State Fair. 15-year-old Shirley became pregnant after three weeks of dating and the pair wed the following year. A year after his daughter's birth, Speck was sentenced to three years in prison for forgery and burglary, but was paroled after 16 months. Free for just a few weeks, he was arrested again when he attacked a woman in the parking lot of her apartment building with a 17-inch carving knife. A clerical error resulted in him serving just six months of a 16-month sentence. Shirley Malone was likely far from pleased to have her husband return to her. Speck was a cruel, terrifying man who often assaulted her at knife point. Fearful of his ever-growing aggression, Shirley filed for divorce and fled with her child. Speck continued wreaking havoc in Dallas, racking up 41 arrests before his younger sister Carolyn dropped him at a bus depot, insisting he returned to Illinois for a fresh start. But the relocation did nothing to quell her brother's penchant for drugs, alcohol, and violence. Speck initially stayed with family friends in Monmouth, Illinois, where his brother found him work helping a carpenter. Despite having familial support, Richard soon began to fall back into his old ways. This was only accelerated when he learned that his now ex-wife had remarried two days after the divorce had been granted. Not long after this, he threatened a man with a knife, robbed a grocery store, and then burgled and assaulted a 65-year-old woman, tying her up and stealing the $2.50 she had earned babysitting that evening. His crimes would soon escalate further. On April the 13th, 1966, the body of a barmaid, Mary Catherine Pierce, was found in an empty hog house behind the tavern she worked at. She died from a severe blow to the abdomen that had ruptured her liver. Due to the fact that he was known to frequent the bar where Mary worked and no doubt his long list of arrests, Richard Speck was questioned and told to stay in town as authorities wanted to quiz him further. When police arrived at Speck's lodgings the next day, they discovered he'd skipped town. He had fled to Chicago, where he moved in with his sister Martha 
on the city's northwest side. There he spun a web of lies, claiming he had been forced to leave Monmouth after he refused to become a crime syndicate drug mule. Martha's husband, Jean, had previously served in the US Navy and so was able to help Speck find work with the United States Merchant Marine working as an apprentice seaman. Once his application had been processed, he quickly found work on the Clarence B. Randall, but this soon came to an end after he fell ill with appendicitis. The next few weeks and months saw Speck making regular visits, often under pressure from his sister, to the National Maritime Union hiring hall looking for work. He didn't have much luck, and when he did find work, drink would often see it brought to a swift end. By July, Jean and Martha had grown tired of Speck's excuses, and on July 11th, Jean dropped Speck off at the NMU hiring hall and told him to stay until he found a ship to take him. After two days, he grew tired of waiting and took the $25 his sister had given him to the taverns. After a day of drinking, he sexually attacked 53-year-old Ella May Hooper and stole her .22 caliber Rome pistol. Armed, drunk and angry, Speck set out to find another target. A mile into his stroll of Chicago's south side, he stumbled across a row of townhouses in the Jeffrey Manor neighborhood. At 11 p.m., Speck broke in through the window of 2319 East 100th Street. It seems, at least initially, to burgle the place. But at some point, he discovered he'd come across a dormitory that housed eight student nurses. His plans changed. The Jeffrey Manor townhouse was one of three that the South Chicago Community Hospital rented to house student nurses. While they were required to live in a dorm attached to the hospital during the first two years, the female students were permitted to room together at the townhouses during their final year. While the simple townhomes were not luxurious, senior students relished the extra independence that came with the privilege. A small home had one bathroom and three bedrooms upstairs, with a living room, kitchen and powder room on the first floor. The tight quarters made the nurses who lived there fast friends. When Richard Speck broke in that unusually cool July night, the townhouse was home to eight student nurses. Corazon Amorao, Melita Gargulo and Valentina Passion, all 23 and from the Philippines, and five American students, 20-year-old Patricia Matusek, 20-year-old Pamela Wilkening, and 24-year-old Nina Schmel, 22-year-old Gloria Davy, and 21-year-old Suzanne Farris. Most of the women had worked the earlier 7 a.m. till 3 p.m. shift that day, so they were in their beds when Speck entered. The first door he knocked on was that of Corazon and Melita. The knock was soft, and Corazon assumed it was one of the other nurses afraid to wake them if they were sleeping. She slipped out of the top bunk and walked to the door. When she opened it, she was met by Speck. Tall, lanky, with slicked back blonde hair and a face full of pock marks, holding a small black revolver in one hand. Speck forced Corazon and Melita out of the room and herded them into the largest bedroom, rousing the other nurses as he went. The three Filipina nurses took the opportunity to barricade themselves in a closet. The only phone in the house was downstairs in the kitchen. They couldn't call for help, so they needed to keep the intruder at bay. But soon, one of the American nurses spoke to them calmly through the door. He won't hurt us, the voice said, and the three women opened the closet. Speck forced the six nurses to sit in a circle on the floor. An unspoken plan formed amongst the women. Stay calm, follow his directions, and maybe we'll live. Speck was quiet and even seemed gentle. He explained to the nurses that he had unlocked the back door by reaching through a window and wanted money. 
He led them together through the house to collect their purses and gathered their cash into a single stack. Then he led them back into the largest bedroom and counted them again to ensure no one had escaped. In the street below, Gloria Davy was saying goodnight to her fiancé after letting herself in through the back door. She used the phone in the kitchen to call her parents. It was part of her routine to call and let her mum know she was safely inside for the night, even though her childhood home was within walking distance of the townhouse. Not hearing any movement upstairs, Gloria assumed her housemates were asleep and she quickly padded up the stairs to her room. At the top, Speck waited for her. He ordered Gloria to empty her pocketbook and then took her to join the other women. Don't be afraid, I'm not going to kill you, he told her. He began ripping bed sheets into strips, casually chatting with the women as he worked and stopping for cigarette breaks. He tied their wrists behind their backs and their ankles together. When only Melita and Corazon remained unbound, the doorbell rang. Speck walked the two nurses downstairs to see who was at the door. Cora, likely recognizing the difference between the sound of the front and back doorbells, deliberately led Speck to the front of the house. Meanwhile, Tammy was turning to walk away from the back door. By the time they checked the second door, she was gone, and Corazon had spared her next door neighbor from a horrific fate. When the trio returned upstairs, Speck grabbed Pamela Wilkening and placed a gun to her back. He ordered her to the other bedroom. The remaining nurses listened as Pamela made a small noise and then fell silent. On the other side of the wall, Speck had shoved a cloth in her mouth and was beginning to sexually assault her. It was then that the final roommate, Suzanne Farris, arrived home for the night, accompanied by her friend, Marianne Jordan. Now, there were nine women in the house with Richard Speck. They climbed the stairs and discovered Speck assaulting Pamela. Suzanne and Mary Ann turned to run, but Speck slipped in front of them and blocked the stairs. He forced them into the bedroom with Pamela and viciously attacked them with a switchblade. Suzanne was stabbed multiple times and strangled with a nylon stocking. Marianne and Pamela also both received fatal stab wounds. Speck then callously tossed a sheet over the bodies and walked to the bathroom to clean up. In the larger bedroom, the remaining women were trying to devise a plan to escape. They had assumed Speck would steal from them and leave, but now they knew he was not just a burglar. The Filipina nurses wanted to throw a lamp out the window to attract attention. The Americans argued that their best bet was staying calm and doing whatever Speck wanted. As they discussed in heated whispers, Speck returned. He took Nina next, then Valentina. Each time Speck was careful to make sure his victims didn't make any noise and washed his hands and knife before returning to the bedroom. This way, None of the nurses knew exactly what fate awaited them. They were unsure if the ones who had been led away were injured, dead, or simply tied up elsewhere in the house. In the commotion of Speck taking the nurses from the room, Corazon slipped under one of the bunk beds and wiggled as far against the wall as possible. After Valentina, Speck took Melita, then Patricia, who he left dead on the bathroom floor, covered with blood. He no longer cared about concealing his victims from the others. There was only Corazon, hidden under the bed, and Gloria left. Gloria had drank quite a bit of champagne that evening and fell asleep shortly after Speck tied her up, blissfully unaware of what was unfolding around her. At 2.30 a.m., he returned to the bedroom again, slamming the door behind him. The noise startled Gloria awake. From her hiding spot, Corazon watched as Speck set upon her housemate and then dragged her from the room. Corazon was sure that the intruder must realize that she was in the room somewhere 
and decided to change her hiding place before he returned. She wiggled out from under the bed and inched across the room, determined not to make a sound. She slipped under the other bottom bunk and covered herself with a blanket. When Speck returned nearly an hour later, he glanced around the empty bedroom and left. Somewhere in his haze of murder and malice, he'd lost count of the women. Corazon lay silent for hours, terrified Speck was lying in wait. At 6 a.m., she pulled herself free and walked through the house, which was now a scene of bloody horror. She knocked out a screen on the second story and began screaming for help. They're all dead, she cried over and over. Despite the horrific trauma she'd endured, she was able to tell the police that the man who'd murdered her roommates was white in his early 20s, had a serpent tattoo on one arm, and another that said, born to raise hell. On July the 16th, a man named Claude Lunsford contacted police to inform him that he had recognized the man posted in sketches as Richard Speck. He informed them that the pair had been drinking the night before and he was now staying at the Star Hotel. While police have records of the call, they did not respond to it. On July 17th, however, a doctor at Cook County Hospital named Leroy Smith treated a man who had attempted to take his own life. As he sponged blood away from the man's arm, he revealed a tattoo, born to raise hell. He quickly alerted police and Corazon in her nurse's uniform identified him in his hospital bed. Once arrested and charged, Richard Speck faced eight counts of first-degree murder and the death penalty. While he waited trial, Speck was interviewed by Cook County Jail psychiatrist Dr. Marvin Zipperin. Zipperin stated that he believed Speck suffered from organic brain syndrome caused by brain injuries he had suffered in his youth. When he was three months old, he suffered a bout of pneumonia which led to him spending a month in an oxygen tent. In an interview, Zipporan states that he believes this meant Speck's developing brain was starved of enough oxygen to develop normally. He also said that Speck suffered an amazing amount of head injuries. However, a panel of psychiatrists found him able to stand trial. Despite his time with the defendant, Zipporan would not be called to testify for either the defense or prosecution after it was found he planned to write a book about Speck from which he would benefit financially. In 1967, he and co-writer Jack Altman gave an interview about their thoughts on Speck. I'll leave a link to it in the comments below but I will state that at times, it can be a frustrating listen. The trial would eventually take place in April of 1967. The accused stated that he was high and drunk at the time of the attack and had no memory of the event. He had, however, confessed to Dr. Leroy Smith, but because he had been sedated at the time, it was decided that this wouldn't stand in court. This meant the case hinged on the prosecution's star witness. For over a year, Corazon Amaral had been closely protected by authorities. Now was her time to take to the stand. Despite some doctors believing she'd lapse into psychosis if asked about what happened on that night, Corazon stood strong and testified in great detail about the man's murderous rampage through the nurse's home and met his eyes as she identified him to the jury. On April the 15th, that jury took 49 minutes to reach a guilty verdict on all counts and Richard Speck was sentenced to death. This wasn't the end of the story, however. In 1971, the killer's sentence was overturned when an appellate court found that over 250 potential jurors had been eliminated due to their conscientious 
or religious beliefs about the death penalty. While Speck awaited new sentencing, the US Supreme Court ruled that the death penalty was unconstitutional and Speck's sentence was commuted to 400 to 1,200 years in prison. Speck served his eight life sentences at the Statesville Correctional Center. He granted only one press interview to a Chicago Tribune columnist. In the 1978 meeting, he admitted publicly to the murders for the first time and said he'd blacked out during the killings. Speck was also interviewed by legendary FBI profiler John Douglas. He told Douglas that he enjoyed keeping birds in his cell. Once, he'd nursed an injured sparrow back to health and tied a string around its leg, taking it everywhere perched on his shoulder. When a guard told Speck pets weren't allowed, the killer walked over to a spinning fan and tossed the little creature into its blades. If I can't have it, no one can, Speck said. On December the 5th, 1991, Richard Speck died of a heart attack, one day shy of his 50th birthday. Five years later, an anonymous source gave a video to a Chicago news anchor. The footage was taken at Statesville Correctional Center in 1988 and appeared to show Richard Speck imbibing in drugs and alcohol performing lewd acts on other inmates and sporting a pair of breasts he had grown through taking smuggled hormones. At one point in the video, Speck tells the camera, if they only knew how much fun I was having, they'd turn me loose. He was also far from repentant for his evil acts. During the video, he admits to the murder, stating he had no feelings and felt no remorse. After the trial, Corazon Amorao returned to the Philippines and started a family before eventually returning to the US where she continued to pursue her career in the medical field, eventually retiring at the age of 68. She is a pillar of strength but has no interest in the spotlight and rarely speaks publicly about the event. Her friends and family speak in her absence and state that while she still occasionally has nightmares about the horrific killings, she feels that she was spared by God and is determined to live her life to the fullest in honor of the friends she lost on that fateful night in 1966.